real quick. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, in the name of one God, amen. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day, Lord. We thank you for this opportunity. We may once again rise up early on Sunday mornings to come and to meet you at your house, Lord, because we know that your house is a place full of your glory, full of your presence, Lord. I ask that your presence just fill this upper room right now, that you will, that you will be present, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will be guiding We'll actually, we'll be wrestling with all of our hearts today, Lord. There's so many takeaways from today's message, Lord, and, and the message directly from your word. I ask that you give me the gift of prophecy that I may deliver your word to your people, Lord. And I ask that today be a day, Lord, where decisions are made, Lord, that tomorrow be a day that they are implemented, Lord, because we want to be just diligently working towards you, Lord. I ask that you have mercy on us, Lord, and you forgive us our sins. Hear these prayers of concession of our sins from our tears. Here's where we pray in one voice, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, deliver us from the evil one, through Christ Jesus our Lord, who has the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Okay, so... <clears throat> actually find out where my notes are. All right, so welcome back. Um, <clears throat> So um, I know that I've been kind of postponing, you know, choosing like my next series and knowing what we're going to kind of talk about. And um, I had a fear of commitment and I didn't know what I wanted to talk about. Um, so when I, when I finally decided, I decided that we're going to do something that I hope it trickles from our Sundays and it's going to trickle throughout the week until we meet again like next Sunday. Um, because if you guys know, um, there's three weeks left in the Coptic New Year. And I know Abuna was talking about that a little bit, the Coptic New Year, which is September 11th, which is a horrible day for the terrorist attacks to, to take place, because now every September 11th, if you drive by an Orthodox church, what do you see? A party, right? So not the message that we're typically going for. Um, it's unfortunate, but you'll never forget when Eruz is, because it's every year on September 11th. And so I wanted to choose something that had three chapters, just because I want to kind of run this out, and I was thinking about this. And, and actually, I started thinking about it last Thursday, because in our men's group, we were, we were we're kind of like at the twilight of like Moses's life, right? Where it's all coming to the end. They've wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. And he's actually kind of has like a couple of these monologues where he's kind of telling the nation of Israel, kind of like, it's almost like his farewell speech, right? And he's putting these decisions in front of him. And I started thinking about that. And I started thinking about one of my favorite books of the Bible, Second Timothy, um, because there's this beauty of having these, like these giants, like these spiritual giants. And when they have like these last opportunities, right? Like the last epistle or Moses, like the last time he's addressing the nation of Israel. You get all of like these years of like memories, wisdom, experiences, kind of like a farewell address almost, right? Where they're trying to impart all of that wisdom to whoever they're speaking to. And I was actually thinking about doing Second Peter. I mean, I'm sorry, um, Second Timothy, because it's one of my favorite books of the Bible. How many chapters in Second Timothy? Four. Didn't line up well. So that got, <laughs> that got scrapped, right? So, what book does have three chapters in it? Yes, not the one I was thinking of, though. Um, Second Peter, right? So, I started getting into Second Peter, and it actually, it, it, it matches up with kind of everything I wanted to talk about because, you know, it was one of the books that was written at the end of his life. And when you start getting into Second Peter and you start seeing, like, it's almost kind of nostalgic when you're reading because you can see that he's going back. And he's reliving a lot of the life experiences that he had while he's writing this to the church. Um, so <clears throat> I'm going to give you guys uh, an easy question. Who wrote 2 Peter? All right, good. We're starting strong, OK? So <laughs> did Tom get it wrong? <laughs> so clearly St. Peter wrote it. He addressed it to a local church. And it appears to be the same church that he wrote First Peter 2. So you can tell it's a close, it's a church that's close to his heart, right? Because in 2 Peter 3, 1, it says, the second letter I am writing to you, right? So when? When did he write this letter? Well, he wrote this letter when he was in Rome because he heard that this church that he really loved, this one that he was very connected to, was going through a hard time, right? Because at this time, there was false teachers. There was heresies that were creeping into the church. 
And it really was like heavy on his heart because this was a church that he really loved. Um, and because of this love, he could not help, but he, he needed to get involved. He needed to say something. He needed to write this letter so they could bring them the truth. Um, why did he write it? Well, he wrote it because this church was still very young. It was dealing, you know, in the first epistle he wrote to them, they were dealing with persecution, right? They were, they were dealing with suffering. You know, that's what the first epistle of St. Peter was all about. But now, you know, they're a little bit older and they had a different battle on their hands. Now it wasn't the suffering and the persecution. Now it was division within the ranks. There was heresy, there was false teaching and all of this other stuff that was kind of creeping in. And St. Peter basically wrote this because if there's one thing that's really, really important is we have to have right teaching. If you don't have right teaching, then it doesn't matter how faithful you are to those teachings. It doesn't matter how wholeheartedly you will pour yourself into them. If you have wrong teaching, then you're off. Because I know a lot of the times we say, hey, it's all about how I live, right? Like as long as I live okay, everything falls into place, right? But to live correctly, you have to know the truth correctly. So this is what St. Saint, Saint Peter is saying. Is you, you have to know because if, you, if you're believing in the wrong things, then you're going to live in the wrong way. And that was one of his over, like, you know, arching themes in this book. And I love it. So, and, and what I'm hoping for is because this is three, um, three chapters in this book, I am hoping, and I hope this is not an undo, like, like too big of a burden on you, okay? But today we're going to cover chapter one together, right? And I'm kind of going to roll through it topically. But my goal is in the next six days that on your own, you will read chapter two, Okay. Is that, too, is that too heavy for anyone? Chapter 2 only has 22 verses in it. If you want to split it up, you can average about three to four verses a day, you know, and we can, we can get there together. And then next week when I'm talking about chapter 2, you guys will already be familiar with all of this stuff. And I think that it'll allow us to take a, a deeper dive. Okay, so it starts off um, kind of as an encouragement, right? To know God and to know what he's done. And he addresses himself as Simon Peter. And I'll tell you, there's so much riches in the Bible that like you can just geek out on any certain verse in there, right? And the whole fact that he even addresses himself as Simon Peter, you know, we can camp there for like the rest of the day. Because what was his, what was his like birth given name? Simon, okay? What, and we all know that, that at a certain point in time, who changed his name? Christ. Christ himself said, and you'll be known as Peter. Right? And on this church, I mean, on this rock, I will build my church. So I'm going to tell you something. If you had a birth-given name and a God-given name, which one would you use? I would be like, I'm Peter all day. Right? Forget that Simon guy. That guy, was, that guy was a schmuck. Right? Like He had all these bad qualities, these bad characteristics. But we have to remember that St. Peter, he was built different. Right? And he, himself, you know, he's, he's going back and he's saying, I still have a lot of Simon. And I, I, I've also been called to be Peter, right? And what's the best way to always stay humble? Because you look at St. Peter, St. Peter, prior St. Peter, you know, in the Gospels, he was not known as a humble man. You know, he was the one, he was self-promoting. He was like the one to open his mouth up. He was always like in someone's face giving the wrong answer at the wrong time, right? But now you, you fast forward after, after everything, right? And you see that the amount of humility that he acquired, right? Well, how do we stay humble like that? It's not about looking at where you are, but it's look, where, where did he pick me up from, right? And St. Peter, even just by the way that he's addressing this letter, you can see that he never forgot the Simon part, right? He always remembered, you know, that, that he was Simon, and it was by the grace of God that there was a little bit of Peter in him. And then after he addresses himself, he says, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, right? Again, you just hold on to that for a second and you say, okay, I got a bond servant and I got an apostle. Which one would you lead with? How many apostles were there? Not many, right? Not many. So you would think that he would lead, his resume would start saying, I'm an apostle, one of the few. Matter of fact, inner circle, top three. But he's saying, no, I'm a bond servant. Like I'm a slave, slave until death. You know, and he says, and, and I, I'm a slave. And I also happen to be an apostle, right? He considered himself a bond server and then the apostle, right? So then he moves on. He starts addressing the fact that, and he's, and he's telling the church, right, that we have this precious faith, right, that is in our Lord, God and Savior, Jesus Christ, right? He's the like faith, right? 
where he starts, you know, where we should all start. And I will tell you, in this book, what we're going to realize, there's this repetition, and it keeps saying, Christ our Savior, Christ our Savior, Christ our Savior. And he's always going back because that is foundational. He never gets away from the fact that we needed a Savior, and that Savior was Christ. Right? And he brings it up over and over and over again, that Christ is the one, you know, because what does the Savior bring? The Savior brings salvation. And he says, we can't go anywhere. We're not going to go, like, that, it all starts and ends there, right? Like, the, the, we needed a Savior, and Christ is the Savior, and he brought us salvation, right? And so Christ, our Savior, and the Savior delivers. That's in the name. The Savior delivers. But what does he deliver us from? What are three things that we can get from Christ that we cannot get anywhere else? You know, we know that we get salvation. But I'm going to tell you, if you show up here and you say, the only thing that I'm looking to get from Christ is salvation, then you're going to have a tough life. Okay, because salvation, we work it all out for salvation, but Christ gives us so much more than just salvation. The first thing he gives us, he gives us his righteousness. His righteousness. When we trust him as our Savior, what does it say? It says that his righteousness becomes our righteousness. Even today in the, in the sermon today, Abuna was talking about St. Anthony when he had the vision he was going up towards heaven. And the demons were attacking him, basically saying he can't go there, right? And he started giving an account from birth, right? Not from conversion, not from baptism, not from, no, from birth. And he says that the angels are, you know, they're like defending him. The demons are attacking him. But when we are in that battle, whose righteousness do we stand on? It's not ours. If we fall on ours, then guess what? It's, we lose, right? But God, he gives us his righteousness, the second thing that, that Christ gave us was grace. This is God's favor to the undeserving. And if you don't feel that you need grace, then you will never have it. If you somehow think that you did something right and that God is, God is responding to your goodness, then you've missed it. Because God in his grace, he gave us what we don't deserve, which is him, which is salvation, which is the gifts. You know, through Christ, his grace was channeled through us. God's grace was channeled through us, right? And the third thing that we can take from God, from Christ, and what he offers us, this is one of the ones that just kind of blows my mind. It was one of the last things that he told us, and I feel like it's one of those things that in the world we need it more than anything else right now, which is his peace. My peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, right? Who doesn't want that peace? Well, where, where does peace come from? Peace has to come from God. It does, you cannot get it from anywhere else. Right? Romans 5.1, it says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, this precious faith that St. Peter is talking about, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Right? Also, we have, we have the peace of God. In Philippians 4, um, 6 and 7, it says, Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. Let your request be known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your heart and minds through Jesus Christ. Guys, don't we want that faith? Like, I will tell you, we have no, I'm sorry, peace. We have no peace today. Everywhere around us is total chaos. We get people who can't sleep at night, right? Up all night, just anxious about things. And what God is telling us is like, let me give you my peace, right? And I love that, that, that Philippians 4, 6, because it tells you that it's, it's, it's okay to be anxious, be anxious, but be anxious for nothing. Turn that anxiousness into prayer and supplication, thanksgiving. Let your request be known to God and the peace of God. So it's basically saying that when you have these worries, bring them to me. I understand you have these worries, but I just need you to bring them to me and then rest that, that I will take care of it, that I am in control. So then St. Uh, Peter starts talking about this faith and the fact that this faith gives us power. And when we have trust and we have faith in God, it gives us the ability to live differently. And I feel like there's a lot of Christians walking around right now, and they claim that they have this faith, but they have no ability to live differently. And if that is the case, then there's this huge disconnect. Because once we have the life-changing faith, we start our transformation. And our transformation, and I love this because we are the church of the transfiguration, right? From one thing to another thing. We should be, all be transforming to look more Christ-like. The biggest lie that we can ever believe is that our Christian walk is only about heaven. That when we get to heaven, we're going to look like Christ. 
When we get to heaven, we're going to enjoy the presence of Christ. When we get to heaven, that's where it's all about. But no, it's, it, it starts here from the second of conversion. From the second that God is, is giving us his image and he wants to transform us to look more like him. It starts now. And the faith that gives us promises, right? He has given us everything that we need. Can you imagine that you are not lacking a single thing for your transformation? God gave you everything you need, right? The promise is great because God promised you a great life. He promised you that you can take the image of his son. He promised you that you can have all the gifts of the spirit. He promised all of that stuff to you and you have everything you need to do it. The question is, is our willingness. Are we going to pick up our cross and follow him? Are we going to walk in the path that he has given us, right? And I love how St. Peter starts talking about how faith grows when it comes to this stuff, right? And, 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 and in verse 5, right? So again, 2 Peter chapter 1, in verse 5, he says, giving all diligence, right? He's talking about picking up these spiritual traits, right? And he says, giving all diligence. You know, once we have faith and we are sons and daughters, right? A lot of us think like, okay, you know, I'm going to start coming to church. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Everything else is just going to happen, right? If I attend enough liturgies, right? If I confess enough times, if I take enough communion, then the spiritual gifts are just going to start flowing in, right? But that's not what St. Peter's saying here, right? He's basically telling us that your spiritual growth will not be passive. You can't just show up and expect it to kind of happen on its own. We need all diligence in our walk with God. It's going to be hard when we are growing spiritually. He's going to put us in positions that require us to make hard decisions. He's going to put us in circumstances where we're going to have to take the higher road and the road will get narrow. And he says, add faith to your virtue, right? We start with the faith, but it's not the last ingredient because I love it because there's this other passage in Roman five where it starts talking about like the growth of things, right? Almost like the, the building blocks. And I, I never even realized that it was in this uh, book as well, right? Because he says, faith, virtue, to virtue, knowledge, to knowledge, self-control, to self-control, perseverance, to perseverance, godliness, to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. And he's, he's basically giving us the spiritual ladder, right? He says, if you want to get more spiritual, if you want to grow, if you want to care about the higher things, this is how you walk up the ladder, right? We know the progression now, virtue, Knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, and love. And God wants us to possess all of these things. All of these things. Do you think that God wants you to have, you know, blind spots? Do you think he wants to be lopsided? Do you think he wants you to do great in some things and just be really, really bad at other things? No, no. God wants you to be well-rounded, right? Because here's my thing. The last thing he wants is he wants a Christian who has all knowledge, Right? All knowledge, but no self-control. Or what if you have a guy who's got all self-control, but no love? And God's saying, like, that's not the way it works. We have to pick up these virtues as we go, and they complete each other. And I want to take a moment just to focus on the virtue of self-control. Because I will tell you, that is the one thing that I feel that we're, li we're all living this huge lie right now, where society tells us you can have it all. Right? You could be this, you could be that, you could be this, you could be that, right? And what it's done, it's cost us our self-control because we know we can't have it all. Everything in this world is limited. So if we want to excel in one thing, then we have to give up some other things. Right? And I will tell you, if you go back to the original language, do you know what that word that they used for self-control meant? It meant self-control. That's it. Like, and I think so many times we'll dress it up, we'll word it up in different ways, but in reality, all it comes down to is it's really, really important to have the ability to tell yourself, no, this is not okay. This is off limits. This is somewhere I can't go. This is something I can't do. And just have self-control to tell yourself, no. Because God told us to do all of, to have all diligence in these things, that we have to work hard on it. These were not qualities that we would passively achieve. We need to put in the work, and I love this because as we put in the work, there's a partnership with God, which blows my mind 
right? That he will partner with us and he will add them to us. And it's almost like we need to have a hand on the plow and then his hand is on the plow right next to us, right? And to be honest with you, in my personal life and, and, and with those around me, like, I'm not doing anything on that plow, right? Who's doing all the heavy lifting? It's God. But I have to make the decision that I'm going to put my hand on the plow and I'm going to push as hard as I can. And in my own might, that plow's not going anywhere. But he fills in the gap. And it's his grace that pours out. It's his strength that comes in and does what needs to do. But I've got to have my hand on that plow. I've got to have my eye on the prize. And I've got to be pushing. And then the in increase comes from him. And then, you know, he says, if you possess these virtues, right, you will never be barren or fruitful in knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who would sign up for that? I want to sign up. I don't ever want to be barren. I don't ever want to be unfruitful, right? Because there's a lot of times we feel that way. Maybe not in our normal life, but maybe definitely in our spiritual life, right? So the, the question is, is it, could it be that we are not pursuing God's promises for us? We might be pursuing a lot of stuff. It's just not the stuff that St. Peter's writing about. Because what God is saying is if you're pursuing these things, you will never be barren. You will never be empty, right? And, if we, and he says, St. Peter says, if we lack these things, then we are short-sighted. Because what are we looking for? We're looking for other stuff that's not going to, it's not going to fill us. It's not going to satisfy us. It's not going to do anything, right? We're unable to see the godly things. But what are we looking at? We're looking at ourselves. Because all of those other goals that we're pursuing, they're all me-focused. Every single one of them. But St. Peter says, it's like, you know, when we get into that frame where we are focusing on the stuff that we want and we are not focusing on the stuff that God wants, I love what he says. He says that we have forgotten that we were cleansed from our old sin. We have forgotten. And I will tell you, do you know the most convicting thing that you can ever run into as a, as a Christian? It's a new Christian, right? Because when you come across a new Christian, what do they usually look like? Like they're passionate. They're like on fire. I liken them to be like a sponge, right? Like they just want to absorb everything that they can, right? Like they don't listen to music in their car. They're listening to sermons. They're doing this. They're doing that and all this other stuff. Then you kind of look at him. You say, I am not there. <laughs> I was kind of to leave it at that, right? Um, but it's funny. It's so convicting, right? And my question is, is, why do we outgrow that? Is it because maybe we forgot exactly where God picked us up from? We forgot where we were, and now all of a sudden we've got very comfortable, like, you know, well, I'm here now, and, you know, this is, and that's kind of all I need to, to do. Like, we're good enough? And I'm going to tell you, if we get to the point where we start thinking I'm good enough, then we've clearly forgotten about what God has done for us. Because everything that we do is a response to that. And if you are at a point in your life where you are not responding anymore, then you have forgotten what he did, right? Because when we remember, it's all about him, right? But when we forget, the focus goes back on us and, and we leave him. And then in verses 10, 11, he starts talking about our call, right, and our election. He says, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. And I love this because I feel like St. Peter's basically telling us, let the proof be in the pudding, right? Like you analyze your life. I already told you how to measure yourself, right? Like let your proof be in the pudding. Show me your virtue. E examine your knowledge, your self-control, your perseverance, your godliness, your kindness, and your love. And if you do not see those things in your life, well, then maybe your calling's not exactly there. Maybe your purpose, your faith, you know, all of it, maybe it's not really there, right? And if it's not, that's okay for today, Okay, but what I'm going to challenge you is I'm going to tell you that you need to diligently add. You need to be diligently to add those virtues the same way that St. Paul's challenging us to. And I love, I'm sorry, St. Peter, and I love St. Peter's statement. And he says, and if you do these things, you will never stumble. And I will tell you, I stumble. Look, I'm not a prophet, but I'm pretty sure I can sell every single one of you guys. You guys stumble too. Okay, so I was kind of thinking about, okay, what exactly does that mean? Right? And I think a better translation is if you are pursuing these things, it will keep you from stumbling. Because a lot of us, the reason we stumble is because we're not pursuing those things at all. We're pursuing other stuff and we get tripped up all over the place. 
But when we're pursuing those things, the godly things, the righteous things, the, the things that St. Paul, uh, St. Peter's talking about, you know, that it will take our mind and it'll keep us from stumbling. And we are humans and we will never do it perfectly. But we'll do it less if our eyes are focused on the right thing. And in verse 12, he, he tells him again, like, you need to be reminded, right? He says, for this reason, I want you to remind you always of these things that you are established in the truth. Parents, think about that for a second, right? Even, he's basically telling them, like, even if you want, even if you know this, I'm going to remind you again, right? And I'm going to tell you, when I read that, the conviction was, there are some things that are so important, we need to keep reiterating it to our kids, we need to be a little bit of a broken record, right? Because St. Peter here, he's talking to his spiritual children. And he knows that some points are so important. They're so important that he needs to keep bringing it up to kind of drill it in over and over again like a broken record, right? Because God does that with us, doesn't he? Like, I will tell you, there are times where I am so dense that God will send me messages and I will ignore the first one, I will ignore the second one, and I've got this thing where if he says it the third time, I'm like, okay, fine, fine, fine. I'll listen, right? But God does that with us. He reiterates the same thing. And I'm going to tell you, you know, he reiterates the most important things. And one of the things we need to remember, when God's telling you something, we have a decision to make. If we listen to it, we hear God's voice get louder and louder and louder in our life. When we are obedient and we listen to it. But when we ignore it, you will notice that God's voice in your life will get quieter and quieter and quieter until ultimately we don't hear it at all. And the same way that God does that with us is we need to do that to our kids, right? The most important message, messages are the ones that we need to beat a dead horse with. 13 and 14, he starts talking about the urgency, right? So St. Peter, he knows. He knows where he's at. He knows that he's not going to be around much longer. He was told earlier in the Gospels that he would, that he would see death and that he was ultimately going to be martyred. And he, he wanted to remind his children so that they wouldn't be surprised and that they wouldn't lose heart when it was time for him to go. And the fact that he was holding on to this is St. Peter believed in prophetic word. And he knew that Christ told me I was going to die. He basically told me I was going to be martyred. I know that that's going to happen without a single doubt, right? And my question is, is what would our lives look like if we believed everything that God told us? Because here we're hearing St. Peter. St. Peter's making big, big statements here because he believed everything that God told him. Imagine what our lives would look like if we adapted that into our life and we actually listened. And then he says, you know, I want to make sure that you guys always have a reminder, which is, in my opinion, I think it was this letter, right? Maybe it was a letter he was writing. You know, maybe it was his heart for the church, but he was telling them that even when I take off this tent, I need to leave you with something, something that, you know, that, that you won't have to worry about me. And then I'll tell you, like, verses 16 through 18, just, they're beautiful, right? Because at 16 and 18, this is the part where you start realizing somebody later in life, right? So he's much older now, right? And he starts to remember the transfiguration. Again, sensitive topic here, right? Because this is a special story to us, right? His spiritual memories and experiences start to flow out of him. And he, and he basically tells him, he says, look, we didn't follow fables, right? These weren't funny stories. Like, I saw it with my own eyes. Like, I experienced it with my own eyes. Like, I saw it, I experienced it, I heard the voice. It was real. So his, his thing is just personal experience, just pouring out of him. Sweet memories. I'm going to ask you, what have you seen? Like, I'm assuming we've all seen things. We've seen God show up in certain ways, right? And the same way that St. Peter here is holding on tight to what he saw and what he experienced. We should be able to do the same thing. I love this in the book of um, Genesis that we're going through. Everywhere something happened, it said that, you know, Abraham built an altar. Then Isaac built an altar. Where did he get that from? He got it from his dad, right? And then Jacob went and something happened. He built an altar. Where did he get that from? He got that from Isaac, right? And it's this idea whenever God is doing something great in your life, are you building an altar? Are you building an altar? Are you doing something? That, and your kid's noticing this where they're seeing these altars in your life, right? Because God's given us all of these great spiritual memories for us to hold on to and to pass on generationally. But the question is, is are we, right? So then he goes back and he starts talking about the, the transfiguration. He says, what did I see, right? I saw the majesty of Christ. 
I saw it many times, but you see, the transfiguration, that was something special. That was something special. And I love how he goes back and recalls it in detail, right? He says, oh man, when I heard the voice, when I heard the voice, this is my beloved son of whom I well pleased. You know, and you can just tell that this was a meaningful experience for St. Peter, right? And it was an experience that he held on to because if you remember where this fell into the gospel, he basically told them, hey, everything that you just saw, hold on to it, but don't talk about it. He told all three of them, like, don't say anything about it, right? It was something to hold on to because it was so glorious, right? He heard the voice. He saw Moses. He saw Elijah. He saw, you know, Christ shining higher than both of them when God the Father proclaims that that's his son. And then remember, you know, St. Peter at that time, you know, in the best St. Peter fashion, basically not knowing what to say, says something and says, you know, we should build tabernacles here, right? We should do this to remember like this thing and we'll do one for Moses and one for Elijah and one for you. And then I'm going to read Matthew 17, 5. It says, while he was still speaking, behold, a bright light overshadowed them. And as suddenly a voice came down and said, this is my beloved son of whom I'm well pleased. Hear him. So I love this because you know what God the Father did here? It cut him off. So God the Father literally cut him off. Like, dude, you're not supposed to be talking right now. Just taking the moment and you just kind of cut him off, right? And you can imagine at the time, St. Peter probably felt rebuked. He probably regretted the fact that he was saying anything at all, considering God the Father cut him off. But St. Peter wrote about it and it was a sweet memory. Right? Even, even the sting of the rebuke at this point had become a sweet memory to him. And he heard this voice which came down from heaven, which I'm sure was amazing. But here's what I want you guys to think about. Imagine if you were able to experience that. If you were on that mountain when Christ transfigured. That experience didn't change St. Peter. St. Peter came down from that mountain, St. Peter, right? With all of his flaws, shortly later he denied him. So what changed him? If it wasn't that great seeing, that great act on top of that mountain, what changed him? Nothing other than the Holy Spirit. It was Pentecost that changed St. Peter. Because before that, he had a whole lot of Simon. Right? But after Pentecost, he was St. Peter. And I'm going to tell you, in our lives as well, right? I know a lot of us want to see cool things. A lot of us would give our left arms to be on top, of, or even our right arms to be on top of that mountain and to witness the transfiguration. It won't change us either. Because the only thing that will change us is the same thing that changed St. Peter. It's the Holy Spirit. No miracles, no voices, no talks, nothing other than the Holy Spirit himself. And then St. Saint, Saint, uh, Saint Peter goes on and he says that we have the prophetic word confirmed. And he's basically saying that the transfiguration was amazing, right? The testimony of God's word, you know, that's even better. The fact that we have this Bible, the fact that we have all these prophecies that have come true, the fact that every single thing that God ever said was going to come to pass, it came to pass. And he says that's, as bad as, that's, as, that's all that we need. We have the prophetic word um, confirmed, right? And it says that this Bible is a light that shines in dark places. And if you look around right now, it's dark. And there's a lot of stuff that doesn't make sense. From, you know, we've got other denominations that are saying things that absolutely makes no sense. But what, what, what's our guiding light? What's our light in the dark place? It's this Bible, because it's clear. And then he actually goes on and he says, because again, at this time, that church was suffering from false teaching. Sound familiar? Is that something we could be going through right now? A lot of false teaching everywhere around us? And he basically says that prophetic, you know, no prophecy of scripture is a private interpretation. And I feel that that is something that we are seeing run rampant right now. Anybody can wake up today and decide that I'm going to start a church tomorrow, right? Everyone's going to cherry pick a verse from the Bible and they're going to put it on the, you know, on whatever sign that they have. And they're, they're going to start their own church. But that's, that's wrong, right? But we shouldn't be surprised either because it was the same exact thing even, even back then, right? Even in the days of Christ, you had people that would take the Old Testament and they would twist it and they would pervert it and they would make it mean whatever they wanted to. And I love what St. Peter's saying here is that like, hey, you know, the prophecy, this stuff is a team sport right? Like it's not up for a single person to decide what all this is, 
right? And we come together and we decide together. And that's what I love about the fathers because even the fathers, when we take them, we match them all up and we agree what is good. And there's some stuff even in the fathers where we say, well, no, 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 we don't accept that. So we can't just run rogue, right? We have to go because it's never for private interpretation. And also prophecy will never come from the will of man. And if you look around, I'm going to tell you that we see a lot of false churches right now. And they're going around and it directly contradicts the Bible. So why do you think it does that? And I will say it blat like just blatantly, they do it because it benefits man. Because you've got a lot of people that they want the Bible to say what they want it to say. Not because it benefits God at all. We have to make sure that none of our stuff comes from man. Real prophecy only comes from godly men who are moved by the Spirit. So to close, we have to know what the Bible says. We have to grow in our knowledge, right? The character of Christ is in this Bible, right? And how do we live right if we don't even know what the book says about him? Just like this local church, the one that he's writing to, right? They were confused and they had a lot of strife and they had a lot of misunderstandings and they couldn't reconcile the difference between right and wrong. Right? I'm going to tell you that it's, it's a scary place to be, and I'm very thankful for our church because we have 2,000 years of history to be able to kind of de decide what's right and wrong. Right? And in the coming weeks, we're going to learn a lot more about what this church was, was kind of wrestling through. So I hope that you guys will enjoy this series as much as I am currently enjoying it, and I need you guys' as buy-in that can we read 1 Peter chapter 2 by next week. Just, just a simple nod is all I need. All right, cool. Oh, sorry. Yeah, good catch. Second Peter, chapter 2. So, any questions, comments, or concerns? All right, let's stand up and pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, name one God, amen. Dear Lord, we thank you, Lord, because your word is so powerful, Lord, like a two-edged sword. So, Lord, I ask that just while we're spending this time in your word, Lord, I ask that you just that you send your Holy Spirit down upon us, Lord, because that's what we want, Lord. That's what, we, that's what transforms. And I know it transforms, Lord, while we're reading in your Bible, so I ask that you just give us guidance, Lord, that you give us wisdom. Lord, I ask in this coming week when we're all in reading the same uh, chapter together, Lord, that you speak clearly. I ask that you wrestle with hearts, Lord. I ask that you encourage us. I ask, Lord, that your, your voice just be so loud, Lord. And I ask that you give us just the desire and the strength, Lord, just to follow you wholeheartedly, Lord, to cut out the things that are holding us back, Lord, and just to be all in. I ask that you just bless everybody in this upper room right now. I ask that your spirit just always meets us here, that not only just today, Lord, but every day from now until next Sunday as well. So I ask that you have mercy on us, Lord, that you forgive us our many sins, Lord, and that you hear these prayers, lift in the sessions of your Holy Virgin Mother, Theotokos, St. Mary. All your saints and martyrs, seriously, we pray one voice saying, Our Father who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Through Christ Jesus our Lord, for the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.